Erola had done just as Gabriel had said, and rummaged around in his refrigerator. It was depressingly barren, but she was able to find some cold cuts to dampen her hunger. He's taken a long time, said Rosati, who had taken to just staring at the door. He's probably in the shower. I imagine that Sue gets pretty sweaty, explained Evola. What's sweaty? asked Pista, happily flying around the room. The gravity had been adjusted to slightly lower than Yersu's standard, which gave Pista the freedom to fly as much as she wanted. Despite the wings and the Ling build, Tofanda were not meant for long distance flight. It had evolved to aid in navigating the cliffs and canyons they had called home back before developing a true civilization. It's water. Certain species let out through their skin to help cool them down. I can do it too. I have sweat glands underneath my chin, although they are severely atrophied and not much use, answered Evola, as she munched on the salted meat. Pista wasn't listening. She had gotten bored after Evola had said water. She was currently crawling along the ceiling, which Evola thought was pretty creepy. If the rain keeps up like this, we'll be sleeping here, said Nish, as she gazed out of the window, the rain hammering down against the pane. Yay! yelled Pista, dropping from the ceiling and onto Nish's back. You won't be saying that if you have to sleep in that thing, stated Nish, tapping her face mask. Don't care, sleep over, Pista replied, taking to the air once again. Nish was far less fluid about stopping the night, even if Gabriel would allow it. She believed he would have pushed him to shove, but he would not be happy about it. There was a click, and the door to Gabriel's bedroom opened, and out he stepped. It was an odd feeling to have someone you had known for days suddenly look completely different. His hair was damp, meaning Ella had been right. He had been in the shower. He had hair. That was something they should not known five seconds ago. Pierce dropped down onto Gabriel's shoulders and, looking directly into Gabriel's eyes, said, You look weird. Right back at you, he replied, and walked unburdened to the table where he left his PDA. What do you want for tea? Gabriel asked Evola. Can you afford it? Ella asked. I don't have to. All meals are included in my holiday package, he explained. You really did splurge for everything, didn't you? Said Evola, scratching her snout. She answered. A resin steak, boiled myrrh, and a cup of tar, if they have it. Gabriel put the call through and connected to the kitchens. Wrapping his fingers against the table, someone picked up the phone and said, Shula Kitchens. Hello, Yellow, it's Gabriel. I would like to place an order, please, said Gabriel. And as the chef got ready to take it, a thought occurred. Ella, can I borrow your PDA, please? He asked. Why? She asked. Picking pieces of meat from her teeth of her claws. Because I'm on the phone and my laptop is in my bedroom and turned off, he explained. Ella shrugged, pulled her PDA out and slid it across the table. As he gave their orders, Gabriel found what he was looking for. Pista, do you want a death water drink? He asked the girl, who was still on his shoulders and currently hugging his head. Really? You won't get mad this time? She asked, bouncing up and down. No, if you stop using my head as a bouncy castle he replied. Pista's attachment was cute, but he was beginning to wear thin. Gabriel looked at Nish, who had taken it back for a moment, as his actual eyes met hers. It was unnerving, but she was unsure why. She found it almost impossible to read his intentions. Nish had read the most human non-verbal expression was carried through the face, which gave her a severe handicap. Tafanda had solid faces that did not move, only the lips were mobile, and their only use was to keep food and water in the mouth when they chewed. When she did not respond, Gabriel asked, can you have it? I've checked and the drink I have in mind is non-toxic. He waved Erola's PDA for emphasis. Nish glanced at her over-eager daughter and had to make a decision. She was cautious, no matter how unscientific the term might have been. Therefore, it had earned their moniker for a reason. On the other hand, Gabriel had looked it up. And if some scientists had tested it and said it was fine, then was there any reason she should refuse? Order some is hairy as well, just in case she doesn't like it. Nish concluded, watching Pista finally get the hint and climb off Gabriel. They waited patiently for their meals while Pista resumed her flying. She was very good at it, and Gabriel could not help but admire her energy. It doesn't look like the rain will clear up until early morning at best, Rosati said, checking the forecast on her PDA. Gabriel rubbed his eyes and said, with some reluctance, if you don't consider it offensive or something, you're not going to stay here the night. We won't want to impose, said Nish. Though, deep down, she did not want to go out in that weather. It's fine, Gabriel said with a sigh. You and Pista can sleep in my bed, I will sleep on the sofa. He added, gazing at the dumbwaiter, thinking his mood would improve once he had a meal in his stomach. Pista was still nursing her blackcurrant juice, though juice might have been a strong work considering it was about 95% water. She loved it though, and refused the other drink Gabriel had ordered. Even Nish reminding her that Gabriel had gotten it for her had not changed the Tafunda's mind. Gabriel had drunk the Assyrian instead. 
He'd been told the beverage was made from a plant extract, and though the taste left a lot to be desired, sort of like light sweetened cream, the texture was nice. Gabriel made a mental note to order it for himself at some point. Pierce was not so distracted by her new favourite drink to put a crimp in her curiosity or precociousness. At the moment, she was poking Gabriel's belly with one of her fingers. He's very squishy, like a muddly grub, she said. Gabriel could not deny that he was out of shape and could afford to lose a few pounds. As she continued to poke, she accidentally jabbed his belly button, and Gabriel squirmed slightly. Pista did not notice, though, because the moment she did so, she looked at her mother and said, Gabriel's a girl, mummy. What? Everyone cried, their eyes darting between her and Gabriel. I am not a woman, Gabriel reassured, scratching his face. You have a girl part right there, Pista stated, pointing to his stomach once more. This time, Gabriel stopped her from jabbing him once more in the gut. Unfortunately, when he did that, Pista attempted to lift her dress to show him hers. What the heck is wrong with you? You can't do that, Nis said, grabbing hold of three of her daughter's arms. He's got one too, Pista reiterated, not sure what everyone's deal was. Is she decent? asked Gabriel, who turned his head and closed his eyes to avoid the incident. Yes, I stopped her, and she won't do it again, Nish replied, staring directly into her daughter's eyes. Right? Pista clicked her tongue to let her mother know that she got the message loud and clear, before saying it again, Gabriel's got a girl part. Gabriel was sighed before explaining, It's my belly button. Belly button? asked Rosati. That was a strange name for a body part. She had a brief image of Gabriel putting his skin on like a jumpsuit, then immediately shook it from her mind because it was gross. It's a scar from when I was born. Every human has one, said Gabriel. You get scarred the moment you're born? Nish said with horror, with Rosati showing the same sentiment. On the other hand, Pierce began rubbing Gabriel's stomach, saying, Ouchie, go away. It's from the umbilical cord. It attached me to my mother's body, allowing me to share her oxygen and nutrients and whatnot, he explained. It's designed to fall off a day or so after a human is born, he added. How are you lot born, by the way? He asked. They grew them on human reproduction, so now it was his turn. Eggs, really big eggs, Rosotti replied, holding out a hand, showing they're about the size of a football. Same as you, except we absorb it all before we boot it out, said Evola, tapping her stomach. A soft egg that spends some time inside before we lay it, and the baby is put in a pouch here, answered Nish, pointing to her chest. Informative, stated Gabriel. So you're really not a gal? asked Pista, looking at Gabriel's stomach. No, I am not a girl, Gabriel reiterated, patting her head. So where are your boy parts? she asked, her eyes shifting as she tried to guess where they were. Never you mind, stated Gabriel. Funny asleep, Nis said, exiting Gabriel's bedroom and sitting back down on the sofa. I suppose I can understand where she's coming from, still light out, Rosati said, glancing out the window. The rain had lessened but was coming down consistently. Pierce had been adamant about staying up despite her head drooping frequently. Pity, too. Watching Gabriel and the girl was like viewing a soap opera, Evola said with a smirk. Ah, Gabriel said before looking at Nish. I completely forgot. Did you get an email from the mayor's office as well? Yes, I forgot to ask you about it as well, replied Nish with a trill. What were you planning to do about it? she asked. Honestly? My first instinct is to ignore it. I've had enough excitement for one lifetime, answered Gabriel. But, said Evola. But something in my gut tells me that ignoring it would just make more problems further down the line, Gabriel added. What did the email actually say? asked Evola. Rather than tell her, Gabriel simply loaded up his account and passed his PDA to her. Evola read through the message before saying, Just call us so we can arrange an appointment. You could always email the mayor's office and ask why they want to see you, said Rosati as she reclined on the sofa. Gabriel immediately placed his hands in his head and said, I'm such an idiot. Glancing over at Nish, it seemed she thought much the same about herself. I'll do it tomorrow morning. My day's been busy enough as it is. Gabriel mumbled, following Rosotti's lead, and letting the sofa take all his weight. The group was silent. Everyone listened to the rain, and the faint noise of thunder. Gabriel, what exactly do you do? Asked Rosotti. A lot of things. Breathing, eating, sleeping, Gabriel replied, and would have gone on. But Rosotti cut him off. No, I mean, what is your profession? She asked. Gardener, replied Gabriel. You're a gardener? questioned Evola, the disbelief in her voice easily crossing the species barrier. Why do you find that so hard to believe? Gabriel asked in turn. He was a difficult man to insult, but he found that this stung. No reason, really, just... Evola waved her hands before dropping the sentence. I see, 
since we're diving into each other's lives, what about you, Rosati? Asked Gabriel, his annoyance vanishing as quickly as it had come. I am a teacher's assistant working with primary school students, Rosati explained, draining the last of her drink and sincerely wishing she was in a regular apartment where she could simply get a refill in a minute. Gabriel skipped Erela as he already knew what she did for a living, and turns his attention to Nish. I am a cultural xenopologist, specialising in the myths of sapient races. I work as the assistant head of the xenopology department at Tereshian University. It is the fifth most prestigious university in Yosu, she explained. And Gabriel could not help but note the unmistakable pride she had when telling them. Xenopology was essentially anthropology, but concerning all known sapient races rather than just humans. Everyone went silent as the information sunk in. Nish began to get jittery when Erola broke the quiet and said, Somebody's been holding out on us. I wouldn't go that far, it just never came up, Nish retorted, wrapping her fingers against her cup. What are you studying at the moment? asked Gabriel. His interest had been piqued. I'm counting on my fifth project, Nish explained. Fifth? inquired Gabriel, uncertain as to what a project was, other than the obvious, of course. Oh, right, said Nish. University projects are ten-year studies on a specific subject. I'm counting on my fifth, and once I have completed it, I can begin my doctoral dissertation, she explained. You have to work for fifty years just to get a doctorate? No, just to begin your doctorate, said Gabriel. That was a rather long time to his mind. No, before starting your first project, you must do five years of general study and lecture in your position, answered Nish. Then she realised what Gabriel was getting at and added, Devanna live longer than humans. Fifty years for us is probably like ten for you. I see. So back to my first question. What are you working on now? Asked Gabriel, resting his head on his hand. I decided to do something a little closer to home. My project this time is the myths and legends of the Rasulacran civilization. It emerged about 5,000 years ago, lasted for roughly 700 and then faded, Nish explained. There's very little we know about them, so I will resume planning the dig when I get back home. We're working with the archaeology department on this one, she added. But what do you know about them? asked Gabriel, whose interest was no longer piqued but burning. From what we can tell, they believed in the Quintet Pantheon, five major gods with lesser beings called Rasuni, she replied. Resun, being the Resulcrum word for Tefanda, and the Illy, we believe, means guardian or watcher, is one of the loopholes we hope to close on the digs. The Resuni's job was to monitor mortals and report back to their masters? asked Gabriel. One of their jobs, a subset of Rasuni called Hobsabet acted as psychopomps, bringing the souls of the dead to their mistress, Frankel Esuino, goddess of the dead, said Nish, with much relish. It was rare to find someone who found her work as enjoyable as she did. Unfortunately, we don't know more. We know the name of one of the other goddesses, Ishe Ilonu, but we have no idea what she was the goddess of, she added. We were taking a sip from her drink, only to find that it was all gone. Erila might have been silent throughout the conversation, but she was watching it all with interest. Gabriel kept asking more and more questions, and it was evident that he was not just feigning interest. What's more, this was the most he had ever come out of his shell since they had met. Even their lengthy conversations in the hospital had been formal, and a way for him to pass the time. Nish, in turn, seemed to have a more than surface level fascination with plants, asking more than a few questions about Gabriel's job. Personally, Erola found Gabriel to be a fascinating subject, and she found it challenging to turn off the psychologist when he was around. If he had been a Paula Clint, she would describe him as hyposocial, with moderate depression and a mild obsessive compulsive disorder. However, Gabriel wasn't a Paula Clint, and she struggled to put him in any boxes she knew of. It seems she now had a little project of her own figuring out just what made Gabriel tick.